Welcome back, everybody, with Brian Hoyer here on the podcast. We're going to get into some things in the second hour that we weren't able to put on the public recording in hour one. So let us get started, Brian, with the number one thing that people who are skeptical about electromagnetic frequencies in the microwave range, you know, no one would give us these cell phones and let us put them in our pocket. And now there's more cell phones in the United States than there are people, and they wouldn't have us put it to our head if they weren't safe. And I want you to tell us the conclusion to the best study that's ever been done on cell phone safety, which was done in the United States. We hired in 1999 to put to rest the cell phone safety question once and for all at the federal level, hired the best cancer scientists in the world, to create a study to determine whether cell phones cause cancer. And the National Institute of Health, the National Toxicology Program, you can go to ntp.gov or nih.gov or your favorite search engine and type in NTP, National Toxicology Program, cell phone study. We spent something like 14 years and $30 million in 1999 to run a study. Remember, we don't run cancer studies on humans or men and women. We run them on rats and mice, typically. That's how we determine if something is carcinogenic. And we run these studies. So this study was run on the rats and mice with cell phones in the 2 and 3G range, not 5G, not 4G, 2 and 3G over 14 years, and when it came time to publish the results of the study, it wasn't published. So through the Freedom of Information Act, the U.S. government was sued and requested to publish the results of this study that our taxes paid for. They finally did publish it, and I think it was only published in either 2014 or 2018. 2016. 2016. Thanks. Right in the middle there. Yeah. <laughs> so the study was published in 2016. It's our federal government finally answering the questions of whether cell phones have the ability to cause cancer. What did the study tell us, Brian? It told us that the cell phone radiation does actually cause cancer in rats. How and, dare you? <laughs> and uh, and what, what was funny about the, the press release was that that uh, there was a lot of uh, other press releases that came out and news articles that was like, just because it per it causes cancer in rats doesn't mean it's going to cause cancer in humans, and <laughs> and that was like what the I think the industry behind the scenes was really focusing on like how do we like redo this messaging how do we we flip this and twist this and distort this in a way that is like no it's not doesn't do anything to humans that just proves that it does it to rats but all medical studies study rats to see if they do things to humans so it was like this really bizarre like thing that they think they're gonna oh we'll trick all these toddlers out there like like we're just gonna tell them that it only does it to rats honey it's it's not humans i i saw that study on the internet dear and it just said if you read the study, it says it definitively. So there's three levels of evidence of whether something causes cancer, clear evidence that cancer was caused some evidence. There might actually be four levels, equivocal evidence or no evidence that something causes cancer. And what they found in the study is clear evidence, the highest level of evidence that cell phones cause brain cancers in rats and mice. And so then when you read the study, that's what you read and learn directly from the US government's website. But if you then Google, well, what's up with this study? You'll find where the cell phone industry, the telecom industry, put some articles out, what you're saying, Brian, don't worry, it was only in rats and mice. But listen, this is how we determine if something causes cancer. We use rats and mice <laughs> to see, does it cause cancer? And if it does, we put it on the carcinogen list. We don't use humans and try to give them cancer. Like, unfortunately for the poor lab animals, that's how we do it in this day and age. It causes cancer, like end of story. That's exactly right. And so basically, if you have a pet and you believe the telecom industry, like a pet rat, you better like put your rat in a Faraday cage. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that was their collateral damage control, right? Like then they Yeah, that's what they did. They actually had the, the study was set up really well because they put, uh, they call them anechoic chambers, which is essentially a Faraday cage. But they, they protected the rats. They actually set it up in the proper way, which I've always wanted all these studies to do, is instead of comparing, uh, let's radiate this, this, this mouse or this rat, and then we'll, we'll uh, not radiate this one. But the one that's, in quotes, not radiated was still exposed to all the, the ambient electromagnetic radiation. And the one that was radiated was just exposed to one more frequency among the dozens or hundreds of frequencies that, that both of them were exposed to. So in the NTP study, what they did was they actually protected the rats that were in the control group from all types of radiation, all types of electromagnetic radiation, all the wireless signals. And then they just sent the signals in an anechoic chamber again, just the, the few cell phone signals to the rats. So it was a very controlled experiment showing what those exact frequencies do to, the, to our biology, to, to rat biology and mice bi mouse biology. That's so important because, as we mentioned, there's electric fields, there's Wi-Fi fields, there's Bluetooth fields, there's military radar and sonar going through the, the Earth, there's television signals and radio signals. Those are electromagnetic frequencies that are moving through us all the time, and they eliminated those. Now, what some people have said about this study also is that they had more radiation than a quote-unquote normal person would have received from cell phone use. I think they said, well, we let the rats and mice use their cell phones, you know, I'm being joking, but use their cell phones for like three hours a day. Like no one would ever do that <laughs> because they're not on the phone for three hours a day. But however amount of time they irradiated the rats and mice with, remember, two and three G cell phone frequencies, we are exposed to four G, four G LTE and four G LTE advanced 24 seven that it passes through buildings, it irradiates us while we sleep. We typically, not us sitting at this table here, but most people carry their cell phone with those frequencies on it, turned on in their pocket all day, and then sleep with their phone under their pillow or next to their head on the nightstand all night. So we, in effect, are never turning the Wi-Fi off, we're never turning those cell phone towers off, and we're exposed to that 24-7. Yeah. And, you know, there was a follow up study. I don't know if it's a follow up, but there was another study that confirmed those results and studied it in a different way that was actually more practical from Italy called the Ramazzini study. And they found that like they used a bunch of the frequencies that from the telecom industry and they they irradiated the rats and the same types of tumors showed up in the rats. And it was it was so the study has been confirmed by somebody else, you're saying? Yeah, it's been confirmed by somebody else. And it was another massive study that was done, I, I think, you know, by this Ramazzini Institute. I'm not I'm not familiar with them that much, but apparently it's a very respected uh, research uh, organization in, in Italy. So. This study is a definitive study that tells you everything that you need to know, like become an adult, grow up a little bit and go to the ntp.gov or nih.gov and look up the study for yourself. So it's not just somebody on a podcast telling you what the U S government has publicly published on its own website. I want to talk about the FCC for a second, but first Heidi's punching me because she has a question. Well, no, I was just going to comment because we we were joking around a little bit when you know before we started podcasting about in back in the 1980s and Brian like you can humor us with this because like we were all children of the 80s and we remember those old fashioned phones like and people would make fun of the guy walking down the street right like now it's the guy with the AirPods yep or, or ear, uh, wireless headset or whatever you call it <laughs> earbuds <laughs> earbuds yeah. Um, but uh, so, he, you know, the, and the big thing was like, I remember like my parents saying, oh, don't ever put the, your, your, you know, that phone to your head and it'll give you a brain cancer, a brain tumor or something. Do you guys remember that? Like, and yeah. it, but it was, a, it was a joke, but it was like, is it really? You know, like it was always this right. like impending question. I don't know if you want to comment on that. I don't know if a question, but it was just interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's the same. And the, 
it's it's for the upper echelon biz- businessman that's got the newest thing and in the 80s and 90s that was it you know the limousines were the only people who had cell phones and so i think even in some movies they they showed like a guy talking on this huge honking phone like it might have even been like donald trump or someone like maybe in home alone i don't know it wasn't in home alone i know that movie front and back or lost in new york whatever but they're you know they're talking on this huge phone and they you know it it is exactly like the guy with airpods that's that's going and ordering a starbucks coffee and (laughs) it's and so people think like, well, how come it hasn't shown up in, in men and women yet? And it, and it has. If you look at the cancer rate, it's exploding right now. It could be for a number of reasons beyond this or in addition to this. However, think about this. Like cell phones were invented somewhere between like, I think it was like 1950. So the military has been using microwave communications. So your cell phone is a microwave communication device. And in fact, like people think about your microwave oven. You'd never want to stick your head in your microwave oven yet your Wi-Fi router runs on the exact same frequency as your microwave oven, 2.45 gigahertz. You can look at the back of your Wi-Fi router and the back of your microwave or inside the door of your microwave, and you'll see they use, they have to put a sticker on there with the frequency. Mm -hmm. Your Wi-Fi router uses the same frequency as your microwave. Now, if cell phones were invented in the 1950s, nobody was allowed to use them outside of the military until 1984. Isn't that an interesting date? (laughs) <laughs> because in 1984 is when that brick, that giant, heavy, like five pound cell phone came out because we finally put in just enough infrastructure, cell phone towers known as infrastructure for a signal to be reached in like the busiest cities. So all through the 80s and 90s, there wasn't that much cell phone tower infrastructure built yet. We were building it out. So really not until the, the really mid, I would say like the mid 2010s, we started to have massive, because if you remember in the 90s or early 2000s, you'd be like, I can't get any reception here. I'm like, I'm down. roaming. Oh, no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you can remember that, the younger generation may not know that. But like you would go out on a country road and you'd have no cell phone reception. You couldn't make phone calls. Yeah. But today that almost never happens. I remember roaming being like a panic attack because, you know, you're going to be charged like 10x of what you normally are charged or whatever. Oh, the good old days. <laughs> like, no, I'm roaming. They're charging me $2 a minute now and 10 cents to send a text. <laughs> this doesn't happen anymore because now it's ubiquitous. We've yeah. we've basically papered wallpapered the United States with cell phone towers so that we can always have coverage. And that comes at a cost you can find in the NTP cell phone study. The other place to look, if you're curious minded, is the bio initiative report. And where would they find that, Brian? Do you know the address? I think it is like bio initiative report or bio initiative dot org. I believe that's it. That's it. Bio initiative dot org. There's 5,000 500 peer-reviewed published studies on the effects of wireless radiation on our biology. It's a massive database of all the studies that they have collected that show that there's an effect. And these are peer-reviewed and published studies. So I've got one more thing to talk about with, and in regards to studies, all of these studies that are done that show a biological effect are done with an end goal in mind. And it's, it's based off of the allopathic Western medicine model of medicine. And so what they're doing is they set up the study to see if it causes a disease and they want, are looking for a diagnosis. The problem with that is that as a person, I don't really care about a diagnosis that's going to happen like 20, 30 years down the road. What is going to happen to me right now because of this exposure? And this whole new paradigm that that Thaddeus and Heidi, you guys are about, and what I'm all about, is optimizing your human biology so that you can live your best life and your most fulfilled life and and be going into retirement and still active and happy and see grandkids, maybe hopefully great-grandchildren. And you're not going to do that if you're feeling terrible because of all these environmental stressors. Now these studies, they're not, they don't take into account, oh, how much energy do you have? Do you have a headache today? Do you have brain fog? Can you get it up? 
in the bedroom. Why did you look at me with that one? Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, in 2024, I probably could look at you, Heidi. Oh, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> There's questions to be answered. But but don't you see the point is that like like so many studies are set up so that you you are you're not you're they're they're just looking for a diagnosis and once it could get it could get all the way to where oh man they just have enough tumors where we don't really want to diagnose them with this type of cancer but we do see some tissues forming but they're not considered tumors because they don't fit the definition so you can have all of this ill health and all of these things happening all these terrible symptoms that are happening that lead up to this diagnosis and it can it can really really be impacting your quality of life but because you don't have a diagnosis they're not going to talk about it on the studies and that's exactly how western medicine works when you go into the doctor you don't you don't have diabetes until your blood sugar gets up to 100 or maybe pre-diabetes i don't i don't know the exact numbers you don't have heart disease until your cholesterol is this and that or your your crp is at this level so it doesn't you know, this diagnostic method of Western medicine is problematic because it's not considering the quality of life and the symptoms and everything. We're, ba we're basically allowing people to live their whole lives sick, tired, and stressed and saying that that's okay and actually not just okay, but normal and expected. Yeah. And the doctors, they're, that's the way that they're trained to deal with this because they need the diagnosis, the numbers, the lab numbers, in order to give you a drug. And so they don't know a solution for preventing you from getting the diagnosis. They just say, oh, you don't got a diagnosis yet. You don't have it yet. And that's the problem. Because how do you go, how do you say, well, I don't have it yet, but you just told me I'm like right at the edge. How do I prevent it from happening? Well, don't worry about it. You're doing fine until maybe next month when you do blood work again. Then you'll have diabetes, and then I can give you something. That's so awful. So with that in mind, we're talking about doctors being able to determine when you have a disease. And doctors, maybe in 2024, we're starting to rethink this, but doctors in charge of our health. And if we think about who's in charge, like so cell phones don't sound very safe. There's all these studies that prove they're not, but who's in charge of the safety of cell phones in the United States? The same company, <laughs> the same organization that uh, regulates or, or that funds and regulates the telecom industry. So that's the Federal Communications Commission. That's correct. So the FCC, it's quiz time. So if the FCC is in charge of all cell phone safety in the United States. They're in charge of making sure that the cell phones we're using, the signals from the towers, the signals from the Wi-Fi routers are safe. How many people are part of the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission? Well, here's the reason I, I, I misspoke. I said that they're funding the, the telecommunications industry. It's because the a lot of the people who are the heads of the FCC are former telecom executives. And so uh, it's, the, it's that revolving door in Washington, D.C. that happens exactly in the same way in the pharmaceutical industry. You become a top-tier executive in uh, Monsanto or Bayer, then you, you're a pretty good candidate for becoming a politician or having a, a spot in someone's cabinet who, you, who, who that company contributed to during their campaign. And so the same thing happens with the telecom industry, exactly to a T, that that's what happens. And I forget who, was it Tom? Tom Butler? I don't know. Butler doesn't sound right. I don't, I don't remember. But there was, there was one guy who was like the head of Verizon or one of, the, one of the companies, and he became the head of the FCC. And he's like, there is no way that cell phone radiation can ever cause damage because of this, this, and this. But this is coming from a guy who made like, millions maybe billions of dollars in the telecommunications industry so i i before this podcast i looked up how many people are in the fcc regulating our safety so the the epa environmental protection agency should be testing the safety of cell phones but they received a cease and desist order back in the 90s to stop investigating cell phone safety so now the only federal organization that's in charge of our safety is the fcc there are five people only. 
that are part of the FCC. So how many of them, Heidi, are a medical doctor, a researcher, or like something that has to do with like science or health? Ooh, 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 I know the answer. Zero. Very good. <laughs> Zero people have any medical or scientific background. In fact, 100% of the FCC are attorneys. Every one of them is a lawyer, and every one of them came from private practice working for or with the telecom industry. Those are the people. Bingo. <laughs> those are the people in charge of our health and safety. People, like, you have to understand. You have to, com I don't like to use understand. You have to understand or comprehend why the public does not know about this. Just look up who runs the FCC and is in charge of health. And the final thought I'll leave on this, because I know Brian is familiar with this, but I love uh, this article. Harvard wrote an article called FCC, a captured agency. So they wrote an entire case study on how the FCC has been captured by the telecom industry and is not serving our interests, but its own interests. So let's move on. Brian, I'm going to let pass this back over to Heidi and get some more questions for our famous guest here. <laughs> our famous guest? <laughs> He's famous. I know. I was going to say infamous, but... He's more famous. <laughs> In, infamous to the telecom. In company. certain yeah. circles. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'd rather be infamous than famous, honestly. Like, wouldn't that be more fun? It's, yeah. it's, you have to develop like an evil laugh, though. Oh, yeah. Let's hear it. Oh, I thought you were going to do it. <laughs> I already have one. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> okay, guys. So, so moving. Where's your evil eye? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was so weird. <laughs> Stop it. No. We're moving on from that. Okay. Um, back to seriousness. That is. Um, okay. So, Brian. Serious is a star. Let's get away from serious. Let's tell some dad jokes. <laughs> 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 Stay away from Sirius the Star and Siri on your phone. Let's go directly to, let's get back to the point at hand. Okay, don't call your phone Siri. And don't eat cereal. <laughs> oh my God, oh. we could go around with that. Do you know, you know the thing with Siri calling Siri, Siri? It's like, it's a Sanskrit word, like to like, like the creator, like, oh my, uh, like to Give your God. your devotion and your bowing to yeah. this God. Oh, wow. Yeah. So never say that word to your phone. Well, some people say it's a European girl's name, too, but it's also, uh, I mean, I do a sadhana chanting and Siri is in it. Are you serious? I'm serious. <laughs> like, totally. <laughs> like the star. Oh, I was going to say one thing earlier, <laughs> as long as we're stuff. just fucking around. Um, so w when you guys were talking about 1984 and there was something else we said and like we're going to need a translator for like anybody who's not Gen X that's watching this because they're not going to know anything. They're not going to know what we're even talking about. Like, isn't that weird? They mm. don't. They can ask Siri. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm technically the, the oldest year for the millennial. You are? Yeah. You're so much younger than us. 1983. I didn't, know how you, I didn't know you were younger than us. 83? 83. 83. 83. <laughs> what are you really yeah oh my god you're so mature and we're no maybe we're so immature <laughs> no we're just all evolved yeah. Earth. <laughs> okay ascended um, that's a better go. word ascending. ascending we're all ascending masters yeah well okay so let's okay all serious now but <laughs> now i say siri again <laughs> Let's get to some solutions. So people want to know, like, what can I do? So I guess I don't, I mean, we talked about some of that stuff in hour one. So like, what else didn't we cover? We covered the jovial light. We covered, you know, like the shielding, all this stuff at the desk. We covered light. What are we missing yet? We're missing the most important piece, which is uh, we like in, in my practice, I'm, my background is as a nutritional therapist. So I used to have a practice, full-time practice where I would actually assess people's bodies and test them and build specific protocols for their, for their bodies. That whole practice kind of translated into in, an environmental practice where, where when I found out the EMF was a huge issue, I started doing that to people's homes and building protocols for their homes. And so when you're prioritizing something for somebody's protocol in their body, you want to know what is impacting the rest of their organs the most. And so for the home, what's impacting the person's body the most that's in the person's home. And so you think about, okay, 
the, the time that you're exposed to something matters a whole lot. So where do you spend the most time? And then the other, the other part is like, like, uh, like, and that's, that's a uh, duration. So I, I call it the three D's. There's duration, there's distance, and there's downtime. Okay. And we teach this in our electro pollution fix course. Um, duration is how long you spend there. Uh, downtime is when you're eating, sleeping, or detoxing. Those are, those are priority times for your body to not be exposed to stress. And then, uh, and then distance is how far away are you from the source of the radiation. And so the bedroom automatically goes all the way up to the top as far as priorities go because that's when you have downtime and you have a lot of duration. So you have two of the Ds. And if you have your Wi-Fi router in your bedroom, you have three Ds in the room. So what we, what we want to do is we want to prioritize the bedroom because that's your number one healing uh, time while you're sleeping. I mean, your body during the day is stimulated by uh, EMF radiation from the sun. You have, you have uh, all the visible light spectrum. You have infrared. You have, you have even like radio frequencies that, that can come from the sun. Not nearly as much as what we're getting from all of the, the man-made frequencies on the ground. There's just subtle, subtle frequencies that you barely can detect from the sun. Can't even detect them at all with any of my equipment. So um, at nighttime, that's when the sun goes down and you have no, no more frequencies from the sun. And then you also, during the day, you have the Schumann resonance. But at night, like our ancestors, what they would do is they would go into their mud huts, their stone structures and caves, and they would be blocked from this Schumann resonance or dampened from it. And so at nighttime, it's like your body goes into this healing mode where it's tuning into all of its own frequencies. And you're not, you're, you're not wanting to have any interference from outside sources of frequencies. And so you, you cocoon into your body. It's like a maintenance period. And in Chinese medicine, they talk about how the body has a, has a clock. And, and at certain times of the night, your lymphatics are draining from different organs. And so every single input that you, that, you, uh, that you put into your body during the day, sunlight and food, that is utilized at night to repair your tissues and your organs and to help detox you. And your brain actually shrinks by about 40% uh, while you sleep. And it makes room for the glymphatic system to work. And this is something that was only discovered, I think, in 2011 around there, the, gl the glymphatic system by the University of Rochester. There's a study from the University of Rochester that talks about the glymphatic system. But they discovered that the brain has its own detox system and it, and it detoxes at night when you're sleeping. And what happens is it shrinks and then it creates all this intracellular space for melatonin to flood in. And uh, melatonin is a potent antioxidant, the most potent one in the body, even more than glutathione. And it attaches to those free radicals and all those, the beta amyloid plaque and all, all of these, these things that can cause Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, neurological conditions, autism. And it, it binds to those and then drains them out through the cerebral spinal fluid for your kidneys and your liver to take care of while you're sleeping. And melatonin is required for that process. And so that's where light becomes a huge aspect of, of healing. You have to optimize your lighting environment uh, leading up to bedtime and bedtime's like the apex of healing for the human body so that area has to be protected otherwise it's a no-go you're gonna you're gonna have a really hard time healing from any condition whatsoever if you can't heal your brain and the rest of your organs at night while you're sleeping so is this one of the the main things you're doing when you go to people's homes brian is like educating them and helping them protect and shield their sleeping space that's exactly right. We're, we're educating them. We're providing them an experience where they can actually see, uh, see the EMF. Like we're trying to make the invisible visible and the inaudible audible for, for our customers. And often there is a skeptic in the house that we have to 
convince. And so we like to get everybody involved who's there so that we can we can give the, the family the best shot at, at healing and putting in solutions so that everybody can be on board with the whole process. So like what, what would be like the number one thing that you usually coach people on putting into their bedroom when you look at something that where, like what can shielded healing do when you come into someone's bedroom? Like what can you put in place that, you know, like I wouldn't know how to do on my own? Yeah, so there's there's like two basic options that, that we provide for people. And it kind of depends on personal preferences, but it also depends on what we find in the house with some of the other testing that we do uh, with magnetic fields and uh, geopathic stress and other, other uh, stressors. But there's shielding paint that you can literally paint on the walls and ceiling, and then shielding material that you can put under the floor. And we also have uh, organic cotton and silver curtains that you can put up and or fabric that you can put up and make into curtains uh, to cover up the windows to block radiation from coming in but that's that essentially creates a faraday cage in the bedroom that protects you from all of the specific cell phone frequencies radio and television frequencies and it's all grounded so the electricity that's right behind the drywall doesn't penetrate into the room and affect you and raise your body voltage to an unhealthy level so if I'm in a Faraday cage, what happens if I try to use my phone inside that Faraday cage? Is that a bad idea? Well, it's, it goes back to like, like it was when you were roaming. Like you'll start to lose signal. Your battery will start to, start to die. You might still get a little bit of a signal if you have a like really strong EMF right outside the room. And there's, you know, we, we try to create as perfect of a Faraday cage as we can. But inevitably, there's going to be holes, like even with the curtains and like the windows coming in. So... You're going to have a phone in there and you're going to your battery is going to get wasted like a lot quicker because your phone's trying to reach to have us to get a signal with the cell phone tower and trying really hard to, to connect. What happens to my body in that environment? So, yeah, if you have your phone in in there and it's off of airplane mode in there, then you're basically uh, creating a situation where where you're exposed to a lot of radiation from your phone, like more than normal but you're still blocking all the cell phone frequencies from outside. So a lot of people wonder if it's actually worse when your phone's in there. Um, it's not like laser beams and mirrors. It's more like, like the radiation will bounce off the walls. And the way that we have people install the shielding paint is such that we get a lot more absorption into the walls, even if you have a device that's inside. But it's way better if you remember to put it on airplane mode for sure. So the key is like to create this primal sleeping environment and then don't bring a bunch of devices back into it and then re-radiate yourself. It's like you really want to create this environment so you can heal optimally while you sleep. And then there are strategies that Brian, I know you teach of like, here's how you can have all the modern conveniences. It's not like you're going to create a cave for yourself. Brian and his crew, they teach you like, here's how you can have your alarm clock. Here's how you can have your fan. Here's how you can have all these things in that environment. And they're used in a safe way that keeps the primal healing environment intact. So I, I love all those things that you do, Brian. Like he has definitely helped us create our environment and it really makes a noticeable difference to the point where like people want to come stay at our house when we're gone so they can sleep in our bed and then stay in our bedroom. <laughs> as in like my my sons <laughs> um okay we're gonna edit this out but it's 3 15 and travis and those guys are like they're all ready to go upstairs okay. so we need to keep this pony show on the road so, we, so we're, i don't know where you guys are at we're at a really good spot so we did there and then um any let's just do any last things that you want to should talk about the canopy real quick yeah, yeah. okay let's do that. so let's do that and then maybe we'll just like say you know like we could i mean we could do this all day with you so let's just say we'll invite you back and then Sure. Yeah, start off talking about the, the, the canopy situation. Okay. So the other, the other option for the bedroom is to get a sleeping canopy. And we have like the very first organic cotton and silver uh, shielding fabric that we, that we use and we recommend for, for people to use as a sleeping canopy. Uh, we have a seamstress that custom makes them for everybody right now. And I've got a new... Uh, prototype coming out made of the same material 
uh, sometime in 2024. I don't know exactly when that's going to be done, but it's a completely new design and a different, a little bit of a different concept. And we're coming out with new other new concepts on that as well. But basically the canopy is portable. You can, uh, it, it can be grounded because it's conductive. And so it does essentially the same thing as the shielding paint, but it's just kind of like one of those mosquito net canopies that you put over the bed. So instead of painting your walls, your floor, your ceiling and grounding it all, you could just protect right around your bed with this canopy material, which is what, which is frankly what we do at our house. Yeah. So we have one room that's shielded with paint and one room that we use the shielded, well, now it'd be shielding shop. It was shielded healing before, but shielding shops, canopy material is what we use right around our own bed. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just add um, that material is really beautiful because I've seen some that are really stiff and it would feel like, you know, I, I, claustrophobic but this stuff that that you, we got from you is like this gossamer material and it's just so beautiful and it doesn't feel like constrictive yeah it's very it's very airy um it does breathe and the silver the silver actually makes it um antimicrobial as well awesome so brian we're gonna have to invite you back because we could keep talking for hours and hours about all this stuff and we barely even touched the surface of all the things that it would be great for everyone to know about so People can find all the links to all your stuff in the show notes at the bottom of this podcast. And Brian, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate you and everything you're doing. Thank you so much, Brian. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. And it's still recording. This isn't. <laughs>